Hello and welcome to FACTS webinar, Katahdin Sheep, a versatile breed for pasture and silver pasture. Our guest presenters are Steve Gabriel and Alex Kasky. I am Samantha Gasson, FACTS Humane Farming Program Associate, and I will be moderating the session. Thank you for joining us. Before we dive right in, let me take a minute or two to do a few quick introductions. Food Animal Concerns Trust, or FACT, is a national nonprofit organization that is headquartered in Illinois. We work to ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a humane and healthy manner. We accomplish this by supporting humane farmers, promoting policies that make foods from animals safe and healthy to eat, and helping consumers make informed food choices. My fabulous colleague, Larissa, and I run FACT's Humane Farming Program, which works with livestock and poultry farmers across the country. We offer grants, scholarships, training courses, mentorships, and of course, webinars on a variety of absolutely delightful topics. Please visit our website at foodanimalconcernstrust.org to learn more about all of our farmer services. At this time, I am very pleased to introduce our esteemed presenters, Steve Gabriel and Alex Kasky. Steve Gabriel is an ecologist, farmer, educator, and consultant, grateful to be living in stewarding the lands as Wellspring Forest Farm in the Finger Lakes region of New York State. Throughout his career, Steve has taught and consulted with thousands of farmers and land stewards on a wide range of agricultural practices, including water management, agroforestry, silvopasture, and mushroom cultivation. At Wellspring Forest Farm, Steve and his family steward about 40 acres of land in a lifelong practice of restoring healthier water, soil, and forests. The farm produces mushrooms, pastured lamb, maple syrup, and nursery trees, while offering a demonstrative site, demonstration site for regenerative farming practices. Steve is also the co-author of Farming in the Woods, um, that's from 2014, and he is an author of Silver Pasture, released in 2018. He previously worked for 12 years at the Cornell Small Farms Program as an extension specialist focused on mushroom and agroforestry systems. And I, Steve is probably pretty familiar to those of you who have um, attended a lot of our webinars. He is um, a pretty fascinating guy. Um, and he just did uh, one on repairing riparian buffers a few months ago. He's done um, several, I think, on silver pasture. Um, and I will, um, uh, once I, I get off of this introduction, I will put the links to those in the, um, in the uh, chat. Um, Alex Kasky is a first generation farmer and owner operator of Bard Al Brook Farm and Tree Nursery, a 60 acre silver pasture based forage farm and tree uh, crops nursery nestled along the Aradondack coast of the New York Champaign Valley. Sorry about that. Um, and an Indiana farm kid at heart, he grew up inside the city limits of the small town of Goshen, Indiana. He holds a BA in conservation biology, and his early professional life involved multiple field uh, seasons out west working with pronghorn antelope in Montana and fisheries in Yellowstone National Park. After a two-year stint in Malawi, Africa, working on food insecurity development project, he decided to pursue an MS in food systems to sustainability from Tufts University that ultimately led him and his wife, Audrey, to the farm property that is now Bard Al Brook, Brook Farm. He is, a, he is passionate about trees and animals, and a primary farm business goal is to improve the quality and quantity of regional adaptive genetic inputs for agroforestry production systems in the Northeast. That was a mouthful, Alex. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, oops, sorry. I am gonna stop sharing and let um, Steve go first. So Steve, take it away, Steve. Okay, hey everybody. Thanks for being with us here. Happy to be here today. Beautiful sunny day here in central New York. Um, yeah, I'm from the Finger Lakes region uh, where we've been farming for, uh, this will be our 12th season here on this land, but I've been farming for over over 20 years on different uh, different sites. Uh, excited to share our experience with these lovely animals um, today. So just a little background on the farm. I'm going to uh, I'm going to go first in this presentation, share a little bit about our Katahdin experience, and then pass it off to Alex. And I think between the two of us, you'll get a really good um, breadth of, of both our experience and some of the management strategies that we have employed with, with this breed and generally for sheep um, 
so so for us uh we 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 are a diversified farm as as I mentioned the bio um mushrooms actually being our main sort of cash crop that we bring in but we do uh, and are developing a lot of agroforestry systems, which if you're into those, take some time. Um, the, the pastured animals can show up early, but the integration of them in trees is, is a transition, is, is a, a decades or maybe even a lifelong transition when you're working with trees. Um, but that's our, that's our goal to really uh, farm in the image of a forest, to leave a forest behind when we're when we're gone uh, for the next generation is, is really what we focus on. So we do a number of things, including agri ag agritourism, we have some farm rentals. If you're ever in the area and wanna stay in our yurt or our cabin or something like that, come visit us and, and check out what we got going on. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, the, the main field that we started with um, in, this is a, a picture in 2011 um, and was the legacy that we inherited, which was um, just decades upon decades of hain uh, and um, uh, and the, the consequences that come with that. Uh, and when we uh, first, we started out with just about uh, 10 acres and then we've added on over time and we, we lead some acreage as well. We looked out over this field. This is a, a view from the deck of the yurt we were building that we lived in for four years before we built a house. Um, we thought, boy, we do not want to mow all of this pasture. So we better think about something to manage this. And I had previously managed uh, several herds of cattle, had worked with pigs, had worked with goats. I actually hadn't worked with sheep. That was the one I hadn't. It felt like the right fit for our landscape for the amount of acreage that we had ready in pasture. Uh, and so we just kind of uh, started there and started in 2013 with, with a small flock of sheep. This is a, a bit more of what it looks like today. Same, can't, same kind of shot from the deck. Um, where you can see quite quite a bit of vegetation filling in the space and and now grazing, uh, not being open and sort of uh, uh, a blank slate here, but actually really being integrated into a lot of our different production systems from small orchards to rows of tree crops to water features and, and swales and things like that. Um, so I, I spoke previously with FACT um, on a webinar called Right Animal, Right Place, Right Time that might be of interest to some folks. And I just wanted to mention this, that um, through the process of working with lots of different animals, uh, learn that there, it's really important to, to match the animals to your goals, to the stage of succession that your land is on, um, and to local markets, really, at the end of the day, um, if your goal is to, is to sell products from these animals. Um, for us, uh, it was a bit of a narrowing. Like I said, sheep kind of made sense because we had some steeply sloped land. We didn't have a ton of acreage and pasture um, and felt like we needed smaller animals to be able to manage. And I just gotten off this cattle farm and there's a lot of infrastructure, a lot of fencing, a lot of uh, shoots, a lot of uh, loading into trailers and and the appeal of being able to throw a sheep in the back of a pickup truck was, was enticing. Um, so we kind of chose the type of animal and then within that, the breed of animal. And then within that, the culture of the animal, which means, you know, where's this animal or these animals coming from? How have they been raised? Have they been on rotational grazing systems? Have they been in confinement, fed a uh, specific ration? Those are two very different systems, even if it's the same breed or type of animal um, that can have a big impact. I um, mean, you want to find uh, and invest in really good stock from the beginning, I think, uh, regardless of what um breeds you might choose or what type of animal you might choose. It's worth that investment because that's something that's going to be uh, trickling down and amplifying exponentially through the offspring of the animals that you're raising. So, so those elements are really important to, to balance along with um, the local network. So for us, Katahdin's actually came kind of through, hey, we want to do sheep. Let's see who's got what around. Um, there were some interesting obscure breeds here and there. There were some uh, more common uh, hair uh, you know, wool sheep that were around that we checked out. Um, and then we just kept meeting Katahdin owners. We really liked their approach, the way they were managing them, the things that they said about these animals. And after talking to a, a tons of sheep owners, um, really decided that for us, fiber was not a goal of production. And so wool just meant, a wool coat just meant a extra expense and stressor for both the farmer and the, <laughs> and the sheep. So it was really appealing to have a hair sheep. And, and basically at the end of the day, it was, it was our neighbor down the road, sold us our first ewe, uh, pregnant ewes, uh, that first grazing season. We didn't have any idea what we were doing. Um, we've come quite a long way since then, but 
um, having her down the road, having her expertise, knowing how she bred and selected and what we were getting into was, was really high quality uh, stock was, was kind of what sold us at the end of the day. Um, so we started out grazing really uh, small paddocks, small amounts of animals, moving them frequently. Um, <clears throat> we're now grazing anywhere from when we have the lambs out on pasture as well, somewhere between 30 and 70 animals a year. Depends a bit on, on where we're at and how much energy we have for them. Uh, we took a break from breeding last year and actually just kind of restarting this year, which is a really nice thing. I uh, highly recommend you take a break from breeding for a year and just let everybody chill. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, for us, the main motivation was to manage pasture and was to play with rotational grazing and see if it really had the ecological benefits that, uh, we had read about, uh, and seen, uh, and perceived on other farms. We really wanted to experience that firsthand. And it's, it, that still continues as our main goal. Um, the, the lamb enterprise is a small portion of the, the schedule F at the end of the year when we file for the farm. Um, like I said, the mushrooms for us and other things are, are more of the cash uh, crops for us. The sheep bring in some revenue. They, they cover the costs, but, um, but the ecological benefit they brought to the landscape, I think, is in, invaluable and is, is probably worth more than anything that we could sell uh, via our lamb products. So what we've learned along the way is that we really have to understand that uh, and I talk about this in the grazing 101 webinar that I did earlier this year. We have to understand that each animal within a breed, within a community is unique. They have an ever-changing diet and ever-changing needs. And this really invites us to think about adding trees, adding diverse forages, and giving the animals basically as, as diverse a, a buffet to choose from as they roam through this pasture. Um, and really the Katans are a wonderful breed to, to witness and to watch in their curiosity and exploration. And basically their willingness to eat anything. That's the best thing is they're really almost like a goat sheep mix that they almost, they, they seem to prefer the woody stuff um, pretty equally to the, to the grasses and forbs and sort of the traditional pasture, pasture foods. And so our strategy is always to let them lead to observe and reflect and be responsive, but trust that these animals have wisdom and they have a community that they're trying to maintain and that what we're trying to do is get them to the right place at the right time with our grazing and, and maintain their health and make the tough choices. You know, the, the reality of, of breeding animals and having really healthy communities of animals is that we have to act as in a sense as the predator. So um, that what that means is making really hard choices. It shouldn't be easy to, to choose animals that stay and choose animals that go to slaughter. That's something we grapple with every year, but it's a reality and it's a really important function of a, a healthy management, uh, especially with Katans, I think, because they're relatively young breed that need a lot of attention in terms of breeding to make sure that um, after 10 years, you have really good stock that's really healthy and vibrant. So um, so we were grazing for a few years. We had a historic drought that hit in 2016. We're in that red zone there. And um, we ran out of pasture. And this is really when we were turned on to both the um, the abilities of these animals, like I said, to sort of act like goats. And basically they lived off forage for 40 to 45 days that year, uh, woody stuff, uh, hedgerow stuff, brushy stuff, things we didn't even know. We kind of just fenced them in the hedgerows and had them go to town um, and really realized their potential to, to be woody browsers and to be able to help, um, you know, in terms of in a drought year, this is sort of an emergency so source of forage when the pasture is not growing or regenerating. But it's also then an aha moment for us where these animals could be a tool strategically to um, have them work and help us manage vegetation, the landscape, manage that succession, especially in the woody spaces that essentially were abandoned by the previous farmer, overgrown and didn't impenetrable. We didn't even know it was in some of them. It was so thorny and thick. Um, and so we really have uh, come to value them. And, and when I say silvopasture and pasture in this in this overall talk, we're talking about pasture being just gra mainly grasses and forbs and legumes and silvopasture being the addition of trees or, or shrubs um, that provide shade and shelter. And, and for us, a lot of fodder, uh, both in terms of like filling them up, but also in terms of a medicinal quality. So here they are feasting on some willow, part of a windbreak that we've planted. And, um, and the tannins in the willow actually provide some really um, benefit, uh, some big benefits to them in terms of um, reducing parasite loads, uh, reducing their methane output, um, and balancing some of their, their rumen uh, digestion, which is really nice. So it's a nice supplement. It's not the main course, it's kind of a side dish, but um, they love everything. They'll, they'll gnaw on honeysuckle all day if that's 
that's what's available to them. And so we've been able to use them strategically to, to meet some of our other goals on the landscape. Um, here's, you know, an example where we cut, it was a honeysuckle and a privet um, out in the field, just kind of growing, cut it down just with some loppers or pruners, uh, kind of laid everything on top of the stubble, let them eat it, and then came back through and, and clipped it again. And this is stuff that then can regenerate next time. They could just eat it right off the plant. Um, and for me, it's like, this is a great way to manage, uh, you know, unwanted vegetation, but also have another source of food and nutrition that's going to balance out what they find um, in the pasture, you know, over time. In the winter, we do bale grazing and we try to strategically put them in a lot of places where we can put to use their boredom, for lack of a better word. They, you know, work through their hay in an hour, maybe a little longer, and then they're looking around for other stuff to do. And, and more times uh, than not, they will uh, start stripping vegetation. Um, so that can be a bad thing if it's stuff you want to keep. But if it's a lot of thickets of honeysuckle, it's been amazing to watch how much they will um, completely remove the bark. And um, and these trees will, uh, these shrubs, I should say, in this case, will will essentially be gone the next season. Uh, maybe they'll sprout from the stump, but then if we're grazing again, we can kind of keep hitting it. So there's different strategies to keep the vegetation, manage the vegetation, eradicate the vegetation based on how you want to work with the animals. Um, on the flip side, there's also trees that we wanted to plant in pasture and play with for different needs. These are red alders that we were planting at the time, hoping that they would work well for us uh, for shade shelter and future mushroom logs for shiitake mushrooms. Um, we've since learned that uh, we're a little too cold for the red alder. It's a, it's a tree native to the Pacific Northwest. I'm looking out my window at the last remaining one of the 50 or so we planted. So the uh, thing with planting trees is you got to accept a lot of mortality, especially early on and try to figure out what's going to work and what's not going to work for different things. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, these were these were doing just fine. Uh, and we started grazing the sheep with them because we thought, why not? And, you know, what a nice picture and all that. But um, the sheep are really advantageous and they will really... Um, you know, pay attention. Often when you look at civil pasture, you'll see recommendations where you oh, don't let the animals in until the trees are above browse height. Well, these trees are certainly above browse height, but that doesn't mean that they're not getting severely damaged. Um, uh, and the alders in particular, the bark um, never really went through a hardening phase, so never really got um, resistant to this kind of gnawing that is typical of the katahdins. Not all sheep will do this, and other animals, obviously, to some degree, may or may not damage young trees like this. But certainly the katahdins we found are quite willing to go after young trees. If they can start stripping the bark, they will. And so that's a that's a warning to the wise for integrating uh, trees, especially young trees, into silvopasture. It takes quite a bit of time. I think the fastest one we've been able to put right next to the sheep has been black locust where the bark does harden off quite quickly and can resist. But if you put them in there too quickly with black locusts, they'll peel the bark like string cheese. It kind of comes off in these long sections. And it's quite depressing. So uh, part of the learning curve for us has been uh, seeing some of the trees sacrificed to these, to these uh, learnings. And now we think about not only browse height of trees, but also is the bark hard enough? And um, is there enough other food? Are they gonna go after this? You can see there's plenty of lo lovely spring grass in this paddock. Um, but uh, mama here is interested in that tree and so is inflicting that damage. Um, so they've been really, uh, for us, employed in, in in working around the landscape. This is a bale graze where we did an underseeding of uh, winter rye um, and then put some relatively low quality bales in there, knowing that they would kind of pick through them. Uh, Katahdins are quite willing to work with the forage you have. They're not, they're not that picky um, in our experience. And so we've been able to say, hey, go after this bale that's kind of lower quality and, and work through it. They'll find the stuff they want to eat. They'll discard the other. The strategy here was to actually leave a bunch of this behind so that we could then spread it out and, and, and create a nice mulch layer after the seed was trampled in by these animals. And so this was a, a pretty successful planting through that strategy. But um, not all sheep will go for that. They might get bored and say, I don't really want to pick at this you know crappy bale all day. Um, but the Katans have been really willing to do that again because since they're uh, interested in woody biomass, they're just more interested and willing to work with, you know, thicker, heavier lignin uh, forages and things like that. So we've often put them in marginal landscapes where there's, a, there's quite a bit of work to do to find, you know, a diverse diet of food. Um, they've done brilliantly in there. So again, you know, really nice animals to work with diverse landscapes, work with landscapes that may not have high quality 
forage, but have something there, they're going to seek it out and, uh, and make use of it. And, and that's really helped us move things along because um, we can't do the work that they're doing out here in the, in the landscape um, nearly as efficiently or with as much joy as them. So, um, so again, they've been a wonderful breed to do this with. Um, here are the same willows I showed before. They're kind of pruning up the bottoms. We, you can see here the browse height is sufficient so that the majority of the vegetation is above where they can reach. Um, and they're kind of cleaning up the bottoms. There's a couple uh, stems, you know, stripped here. But in this case, because these willows are multi-stemmed, it doesn't really matter if a few go down. Um, and so they've worked, they've worked great in that kind of system. Here's them with some black locusts, um, really high protein forage, similar in nutrition to alfalfa um, that, that they do well with. So the breed itself originated in North Central Maine. Uh, Michael Peel was the original breeder um, back in the 1950s. So, you know, relatively young breed. And it's really important to keep that in mind if you get into Katahdin's that there will be work to do in terms of selection. And, and I think people choose if they want to sort of keep it strictly Katahdin or start to cross with um, either some of the origin breeds or some others. I've, I've seen a lot of folks cross Katahdin and Dorset um, before. We've kept it just strictly Katahdin, um, uh, partially because of what's a, what's sort of available, uh, and partially just to yeah focus on 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 that lineage. Um, it's worked well for us, so there's not really a reason to add add more. I think sometimes the critique with Katahdins is is their size, but we've been able to breed for size, and we have we have pretty large animals now. Um, that's a really important factor to to keep on top of early on in the game. So basically, they uh, Michael uh, imported Saint Croix from, of course, the Caribbean. Uh, so a heat tolerant uh, hair sheep started crossing them with essentially like northern uh, Anglo sort of Anglo breeds um, over the years, and was we're looking for an animal that ultimately had a good hair coat, um, good meat, uh, high fertility, and 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 a good flocking instinct, and I would add to that uh, sort of mellow disposition. Um, uh, and good mothering instincts, um, and and sort of uh, yeah, just a propensity to work well in the landscape and not be not be a hassle overall. Um, so they were they were named essentially as this breed came came to pass after Mount Katahdin in Maine, and that's where they get their name. Um, so you know, I think these these breeding goals were were really mostly met, but again, I think there's some some focus on uh, making sure to to continue to remove. Um, uh, animals that are susceptible to parasites. That's always a, a good strategy in small ruminant management, but uh, Katahdin's have pretty low, uh, we've had a pretty low experience of, of instances of it, but it's still good to uh, call for that. Um, size, as I mentioned, is, is a really important factor. Uh, mothering ability and, and instinct. Um, and fence jumpers. Fence jumpers always need to probably leave the farm sooner than later. There's one of our, the, the brown one there in the picture is actually one of our former fence jumpers who had a Lovely time here and and was not able to stay longer because because of her disposition to jump the fence and lead everybody else on a, on a little journey. Um, but they tend to home pretty well. They don't actually go that far when they leave. Um, uh, so that, that it hasn't been a huge issue for us. Um, so that, you know, they're considered a medium sized breed um, and, and highly adaptable. Um, lamb and pasture uh, tend to throw uh, uh, ideally twins, sometimes triplets. Um, which again with smaller mothers can lead to some complications. Um, but if you have good size ewes, we've had we've had pretty good luck with triplets when they've come. Um, often in the first year, they're gonna just have a singlet um, in that year. But um, but generally twins are pretty common. The if if you have bottle babies, they tend to take pretty well to the learning the jug. Um, we haven't had too much problem with that. And to since they have a good flocking instinct, they tend to teach each other quite well. So pretty low maintenance. We lamb and pasture. Um, we're mostly checking on the state, we have to occasionally quarantine a mother for this or that, or separate somebody or do this, but we can mostly do it out in pasture, which is a huge benefit. And the moms generally are, are quite resilient. And you can see their mama shedding winter coat. So they will put on a thicker coat for winter and then shed that right off um, come springtime. Um, same mama, I think. Yeah. Same mama, sweet potato. Um, one of our lovely origin sheep, I guess year, maybe year two or three not quite the first year. This was an instance where we had surprise lambs really early. Of course, after a pretty significant snow, wet snowstorm in January, we, we tend to lamb later in the season. We like to lamb um, pretty soon here. Um, mid to late April for us uh, works well because um, we want to lamb out in pasture and just not deal with the unknowns of weather. Um, 
Uh, but this, these came early for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, uh, and they did great. She found some shelter, had these lambs, there were no issues, that sort of thing. So even in the worst of conditions, they seem to do quite well in terms of, of providing that. We've been able to train them very easily to grain. So uh, moving them from one side of the farm to the other um, really has not been difficult. There's not a lot of errant, they're, they're willing to follow each other. And, and I guess if you gave them grain every day, they might not be as enticed, but for us, um, it's a treat. And so they do really well. It makes it really flexible for us. We have a lot of pastures that aren't necessarily contiguous. So we need a little flexibility to move them through. So here's a, a bit of a sense of our grazing system. And I, I talked more about a grazing plan and, and strategies for that in the Rotational Grazing 101 webinar, if you want to check that out. Uh, but you know, I think it's important to emphasize here is, is we have a plan and then we actually follow the plan, which means we don't follow the plan. <laughs> it just changes and we have to be adaptable. Essentially, the red paddocks in here are potential regular grazing paddocks that may or may not be ready at any given point. The green areas are conservation areas where we've done NRCS plantings and things like that. Might be occasionally open for grazing in what we would call like a flash grazing, really quick, short durations in different spaces. And then the blue uh, paddocks in the corner would be our winter paddocks. We have a permanent fencing system. Um, it's where they spend the coldest winter months, nice, dry, sheltered uh, woods area um, that we work with them in. And they're in there now waiting to pop lambs any day. Um, here's a picture in the, in the woods there. Um, so yeah, highly adaptable. We have these shelters. You can kind of see them in the back of the photo. Um, they're called porter huts. They're like a metal hoop. They don't go in them. Hardly ever, except in the worst snowstorms or worst rainstorms. Otherwise, it's almost not worth bringing them around. Um, we, we stop moving shelters a lot because they just don't even go in them in most of the rainstorms and things that we have. So they want to be outside. Uh, and that's great for us. We don't even have a barn to put them in. And so, um, so we give them shelter via trees, via woods, via windbreaks and things like that. And we have these available. But um, yeah, like I said, only interested in them in the worst of weather conditions. So we don't, um, Alex is going to talk a little bit more about programs that you could enroll in and, and benefits to that. And um, I'm excited to hear more about that and think more about uh, that future for us. We've really just been um, tracking lineages in a spreadsheet, um, making our own kind of personal notes and focusing. Uh, early on, I was mentored by a sheep farmer who said their biggest error was not breeding for size, was breeding for, for favorites. <laughs> so picking the ones they liked because of color, because of uh, disposition and and some of those being the smaller ones, the baby, the, the sometimes the bottle babies, things like that. And um, he could see a diminishing return on terms of their the, the sizes and their weights, and an increase in birthing problems and challenges because of that in their flock. And so he said, you know, if I did it all over again, it feels like at this point I got to kind of start over. And I wish I had really focused on that size uh, piece. And I think with a medium breed like Katahdin's, you can kind of go either way. There's a fork in the road, and you definitely want to focus on breeding healthy, resilient um, use. So we do body scoring. We look at that and um, FAMACHA. And so we're, we're, we're kind of keeping these different notes and then along with our observations of their mothering. And if they have any instances of parasites, that's how we, uh, that's how we decide who stays and goes long-term. And we kind of follow our own sort of two strikes rule, which is really that if there's one issue of concern, then we give us, give a strike. And if there's a second, then that's when we, we make the decision and, based on our numbers and our goals and things, if, if somebody's gonna um, leave the farm that year. Uh, you know, some people just do a one strike rule. Uh, so we've decided and, and, and found that, you know, sometimes a mom that recovers, a really good mom that might have a meningeal worm or something and recovers from that is, is still worth keeping and not necessarily a, a reason to, to call them. So it's worked well for us. Um, highly recommend Famacha as a way to manage and, and sort of check when we, we tend to trim hooves about two times a year is um, adequate. Um, uh, we select for hoof quality because we've learned over time that different uh, hoof characteristics can lead to, to issues, although we haven't really had any major hoof rot or anything like that, mostly because of our heavy rotational grazing and, and our efforts to reduce water logging and pastures and things like that. Um, but we do FAMACHA when we when we do our, our hoof trimming. And so that's a guide to look at the eyes of the animal and um, and score them. And this is for the the, the barber pole worm um, parasite, just to just to keep a, a check on that. Um, and they they really tend to uh, very rarely get into the one or the two, the A or the B there. Um, they tend to be um, 
uh, we, we rarely see anyone in that in that category. And I think it's 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 the rotational grazing, it's the breed, and it's also again the supplements like the willow and things that that tend to help. Um, we've done some projects around research uh, along with parasites, and I just want to mention that quickly if folks are interested in checking them out there. Um, they're quite a, quite a number of years ago, but we did look at um, the use of ducks in our in our farm. We used to have uh, pastured ducks and did duck eggs as well. Um, we looked at the opportunity for that to reduce slug pressure, which is actually the carrier of the meningeal worm, which is um, which is transmitted via deer to slugs, and then the, the sheep essentially ingest the slugs as they're consuming pasture, and that's how it gets in their system. So. Um, there is, we, we, we use ducks for a number of different things on the farm, and um, these were SARE funded grants, a wonderful organization. You have one in your region. If you're in the U.S., um, you can get these small farmer grants, which we got a couple to do these projects. And if you want to read about raising ducks or the slug control, um, you can check that out. Uh, some interesting things there. The, the short end of the research around using ducks to reduce slugs is, it does seem to work. It does seem to reduce slug populations. Um, uh, but it's really challenging with timing, with your timing of your rotation, timing the season, wet times, dry times. So it felt like the management efficiency was 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 challenging to necessarily match with with the potential ecological benefits or the health benefits, I guess I should say, say to the sheep. But you can read about that more in that report. Um, we sell all our katahdin uh, via custom uh, cut. So in New York State, uh, you can uh, do custom butchering and sell a whole half or quarter to customers. Um, it comes back like labeled not for sale because it's not a USDA inspected facility, but it does give us a little bit uh, cheaper uh, uh, slaughter fee. And we've been able to build a customer base enough to, to sell our lambs through that. So we're not selling cut by cut retail. We're probably not getting as much, you know, per lamb per se, but we're we're not in set up to do the retail thing uh, for lamb, and so it's been great to just kind of uh, harvest them all, get them out to customers, and not be storing and trying to to cycle individual cuts. And that's worked well for us. Um, and folks love the meat. Uh, it's really kind of on the leaner side. We've had a, a butcher start to make us a custom sausage, which is really nice. Um, it can be nice to have a little bit of a fattier uh, ground uh, lamb. Uh, but um, generally like smaller chops, which people uh, are like, eh, I'm not as into that, but then they just eat two instead of one big chop from a larger sheep and, and seem to not complain. People uh, don't like the word mutton, but then they eat it and they're like, oh, this is pretty good. So I think um, we've been we've been able to, to really work with folks and sell sell things pretty successfully. And another product we've tried is the selling the pelts as well. We used to send these to a processor in Pennsylvania. Um, they do a really beautiful job of cleaning them. Um, the challenge with katan is the high variability of that hair coat. And so you can see the one in the middle, really beautiful pattern, but really thin kind of bristly hair in it. Those tend to shed and fall out. The other ones on the other sides are actually these beautiful, soft, supple, like, like perfect for like a baby, um, really nice uh, pelts. But um yeah, lots of variability in there. And uh, I think we found mixed success, I will say, in selling them um, because of that. And what people are used to thinking of is kind of the, the, the wool, heavy wool um, uh, pelts as a, as a product. So uh, so we stopped doing that. We mostly uh, try to donate them when we can to like a, a local nature school or, or, or folks that might want them. But it's been a product we tried to do um, in the past. So with that, um, thanks for your attention to my piece. And I'm going to turn it over to Alex for his take on Katahdin's. Thanks, Steve. Good going here. All right. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. My name is Alex Kasky, and I'm the uh, proprietor and operator of Bard Albrook Farm and Tree Nursery. And it's an honor to be here today presenting to you all. I've sat in on a lot of fact webinars, got a lot of great information out of them. So honored to be here today on the, on the flip side presenting to, to you all. So uh, for our farm, we've got two primary enterprises, uh, the sheep being sort of the main one and uh, also a tree nursery. Um, where we grow a lot of trees that we plant out as part of our silvopasture based system. So if I'm not hanging with the sheep or working on pasture improvement, you'll probably find me in the tree nursery or working with the trees. 
just to orient everyone a little bit, uh, we are in inside the Adirondack Park Blue Line in the town of Westport, New York, which is about halfway between Montreal and Albany, right on Lake Champlain. We are in the New York Champlain Valley. And zooming in here a little closer, you can see our farms outlined in gray there. And uh, we're very fortunate to share, um, share a property boundary with Split Rock Mountain Wild Forest, which is the longest stretch of undeveloped shoreline on Lake Champlain. And uh, we are very humbled and honored to, to farm in this incredible landscape. So I'm gonna jump into why, why we raise sheep. Um, as I mentioned, or as Samantha mentioned, I'm a first generation farmer. So uh, I had worked on farms, sort of dabbled in a number of things, but um, this was the first time we were looking to purchase our own animals. And some of it for me comes down to this, just, just the fundamentals of ruminants, which is that they can turn grass and browse into highly nutritious food. And I, I think that uh, might seem obvious to a lot of people, but um, I always think it's worth remembering because that's a pretty powerful tool when it comes to things like uh, carrying capacity or sustainable meat production. Um, because I was new to farming and livestock, uh, at least on my own, I, I felt like sheep were a little less intimidating than uh, some of the bigger animals, hogs or cattle. And we have really limited infrastructure. Uh, the farm, when we uh, showed up, hadn't really been farmed uh, for about 25, 30 years. Some farmers had, you know, leased a little bit of space here and there, but there's no perimeter fences. There's no permanent fences at all, no water lines. And um, yeah, sort of like Steve mentioned, I'd seen some cattle farms and noticed all the infrastructure and felt like that was a little out of reach for us. Um, I, as everyone probably experiences, uh, we have limited labor, uh, which means I work alone most of the time. And I wanted to work with an animal that um, I wasn't going to worry about sending me to the hospital or anything if they were having a bad day. And then, of course, you know, this is a farm business. Uh, we're looking for ways to pay the bills. And we know there's demand for lamb meat, uh, mutton, and breeding stock. So those are some of the factors that influenced us. And then when we were picking a breed, um, I'll admit, I definitely stem from the uh, Steve Gabriel branch of agroforestry and silvopasture. And I, uh, I attended a workshop that he was doing in 2018. And he obviously had the, the Katahdins and was talking about them. And the more I learned, the more I thought this was a really great fit uh, for our farm and our situation. Um, but as I dug in more, I realized you know, there's a lot to Katahdins, even if you're not in the Northeast doing silvopasture. They're very widely adapted. They can, you know, um, you see them all the way from the far south up to the far north. And there's not a lot of uh, breeds of, of livestock that, that can do that. Uh, as Steve also mentioned, they're able to utilize tree and shrub fodder. Uh, we have a lot of brushy areas, a lot of fallow, uh, honeysuckle, buckthorn, all that kind of stuff. And they certainly enjoy munching on it. Um, before I got into sheep, people would always warn me, like, you better be ready for lambing. You won't get any sleep. You got to know how to stomach tube a lamb and be ready for bottle babies and all that. Um, knock on wood, we haven't really dealt with that much. No stomach tubes, a uh, couple bottle babies, but um, the exceptional mothering ability uh, is definitely something that stood out to me uh, of this breed. Also concerns about uh, parasites and needing to deworm. Uh, the overuse of dewormers and that leading to resistance. Um, I, I will mention that while I think Katahdins are uh, inclined to be more parasite resistant, it's not a guarantee. And I'll get into that a little bit later when I uh, talk more about National Sheep Improvement Program and some of our selection criteria. But um, I think generally they are more parasite resistant than wool breeds perhaps, but even within the Katahdins, there's huge variance in parasite resistance. Uh, same with hair coat, highly variable, but also very uh, useful as uh, on the farming side of things. Shearing is a big, was a concern for me. We're pretty remote. It's hard to get shearers up here. And uh, I saw wool as a liability, uh, not, uh, not an asset. And then some of the uh, eating qualities of the meat. I love eating lamb, uh, love eating mutton. When I was a kid, I, I'd always choose to go to Outback Steakhouse for my birthday. And I'd always get the lamb chops and I don't know, I just always loved it. So uh, that, that also was an influencing factor there. So I'm just gonna 
start talking about our flock a bit now. Um, I am uh, newer to the scene when it comes to sheep. We purchased our first sheep in 2019, and it was a combination of five commercial ewes from a grass-fed based farm up in Keysville, New York. Our friends Courtney and Asa uh, were uh, getting out of sheep, so we bought five of their ran uh, five of their ewes, and then we also purchased three registered ewes and a ram uh, from Downing Acres in Burke, New York. And um, I will just say I've, I, I kind of just bought what was around and did a little research, but could have done more. Um, but in the end, having some registered sheep and these commercial sheep and then being able to sort of meld them uh, has been really well interesting and fun, but I think it's also been really beneficial because uh, the, the commercial animals had a little better growth traits, actually had better parasite resistance in terms of FAMACHA scores, but the registered animals had better confirmation and their pedigrees allowed me to connect to uh, other Katahdin breeders for NSIP purposes, which uh, will make more sense in a bit, maybe. Uh, we're entering our fourth lambing season. We've got 19 ewes bred. I know that's probably not many compared to a lot of you out there, but it's about double of what we did last year. And uh, our near-term goal is to try to get to the about 30 ewes and two rams. That's sort of the minimum you need to, to make genetic improvement under uh, NSIP and have enough genetic variability to, to make good selections. Uh, I think our carrying capacity might be more about 40 to 50 ewes as we continue to revamp our pastures, but uh, 30 for now seems like an attainable goal. And then we recently received our first round of NSIP data and we plan to take advantage of genotyping this year. So um, getting a little bit more into what we're trying to do with our sheep, our, our main interest is genetic improvement and uh, selling breeding stock to other producers. But uh, in our opinion, if you're doing that well, uh, you're really only retaining your best animals. So for us, that means about the top 10 to 20% of our ram lambs and about the top 50% of our ewe lambs and everything else uh, we sell and uh, try not to overwinter. And right now we've got a great relationship with a neighboring farm. They have a well-developed uh, marketing branch. They've got cold storage. Most importantly in the Northeast, they can get slaughter slots. Uh, it's something I've had an awful time trying to get for my own animals. So we just sell live sheep to them and uh, that's been great. It allows me to just focus on doing what I love, which is uh, raising sheep and or compound pasture and trees. So sorry for all the words here on this slide, but I thought I'd go a little bit more into our selection process. Um, as seed stock producers, uh, I believe it's our uh, responsibility to really focus on the traits that make Katahdin's unique. So you'll notice my order is a little bit different than Steve's. Uh, I think for us, I want to focus first and foremost on the maternal traits. So uh, I want ewes that are great mothers. Um, they let their lambs suckle right away. They're keeping them close. They're, um, you know, not having any rejections or bottle lambs, uh, good milk production. Then I would say parasite resistance is next most important. And then you'll see, I put suffi sufficient growth. Um, growth's important. You know, you oftentimes you're selling animals based on the pounds, um, but uh, Katahdins are our mid-framed mid-sized mid uh, mid-framed breed and um, I think some people are pushing them to be bigger I, if you really want bigger lambs I would recommend crossbreeding uh, you can use Katahdin ewes and cross them to a terminal sire like a Texel or a Suffolk or something else and that's going to give you some really nice heterosis some really nice market lambs and you'll still be benefiting from all the great things that uh, Katahdins can provide on the maternal side for us, um, there's a few things that we have is automatic uh, one strike and you're out. Um, any you that rejects a lamb and, and we're bottle feeding it, that's a no-no. Um, any significant conformational defect like a uh, lumpy udder or um, parrot mouth, anything like that. Um, repeated deworming, you know, if year after year we're having to administer a lot of dewormer, that's, that's an issue. Um, and then any sort of communicable disease would obviously be an automatic cold. In terms of our actual grazing management, as I mentioned, we, uh, we're a silvopasture-based system. Uh, I moved the sheep through about 30 to 35 acres a season from May to November. I'm working to extend that grazing season, but 
we are pretty far north, zone 4B, 5A. So uh, the grass is only really green here for so much of the year. Um, but as much as I love trees and I love feeding them to the sheep, we also really value our, our open space and our open acreage. So we have about 10 acres that uh, is more or less uh, non-treed. And I'm looking to take a first cut on that because I just can't keep up in the spring um, with the spring growth. And I'd like to sort of uh, mitigate some of the need to, to buy in hay if I can make it here. So in terms of sort of, I mentioned we're pretty limited on the infrastructure. I'm certainly working on that and we'll be slowly building fences and water lines as, a, as time and finances allow. But I'm, I've heard different people have different opinions on what you need to have before you start with sheep. And obviously that's a lot of personal preference um, and, and where you're at. Uh, we still have no permanent fencing. We're solely electro net. I have uh, portable chargers that I move, I think about about five or six of the IntelliShock chargers from Premier One. We got about 18 to 20 rolls of netting. And um, because of all that, and because I'm mostly working alone, our rotations are a little longer. Another reason they're a little longer is because uh, up until now, we've kind of been trying to renovate and improve our pastures. So uh, I've kind of let them overgraze almost. And then I'm clipping it afterward anyway to try to get uh, the perennials down. So. Uh, we've been out about four to six days, maybe moving more to three to five. And then I just want to put in a plug for this electric motorcycle that I totally love. And uh, they were actually developed in New Zealand for sheep farmers, is my understanding. I'm able to pull that uh, gorilla cart there, can take about five, six rolls of netting or about 30 gallons of water. And uh, that's mostly how I get around during the grazing season. Uh, in terms of other feed decisions, uh, we're 100% forage based. We don't feed any grain, um, but we do feed a shredded beet pulp and alfalfa pellet mix if supplementation is required. Uh, we feed local hay in the winter. We try to bale graze as much as possible. Um, definitely push the limits on what Electronet can do in the snow, but uh, so far so good. And um, a big goal for us is to only overwinter our breeding animals. Um, we want to be feeding animals that are pregnant or we keep a ram group but otherwise uh, we don't really want uh, to be feeding non-pregnant animals so that also means trying to breed our ewes ewe lambs young at about six seven months if they're big enough um, so that they're also pregnant that first winter in terms of lambing we lamb a little later late april i try to sync it with our forage resource um, i don't like lambing when it's really cold out if uh I don't have to. And uh, we we lamb somewhat on pasture, although it's a pasture near the, the barn. So I don't know if I, I wouldn't call it uh, full on pasture grazing or sorry, pasture lambing. We also keep some livestock guardian dogs, probably have more than we need at the moment, but I love big dogs and I love working with them. Uh, Burke there, Burke man, he's, uh, he's in the upper right with that little lamb. He's uh, going on 10 now, so. Uh, we, we cherish every day that he's around. He's still in good health, but you never know. So we've got two understudies there, Acacia and Hoosier. And uh, yeah, they've been great. We've had no losses to predators. Uh, we have a lot of coyotes around. We've got bobcats, black bears, um, but we're on good terms as far as I can tell with all of them. And I think our, our dogs definitely have a, a big role to play there. That and always having a hot fence. In terms of uh, health and biosecurity, we're enrolled in the New York State Sheep Goat Health Assurance Program or NISGAP. Uh, if you're in New York, I highly recommend this program. Um, it costs uh, us nothing and we get an annual meeting with the state vet and our personal vet to review our, our health management plan. And I've gotten a whole lot of very, very helpful information out of that relationship. We also take routine weights. Um, I, I, everything we have is portable, portable scale, portable handling system. I can move it all on the forks of the tractor with a pallet. So I just take it to wherever they're at when we need to take weights, which is about every 30 days um, after the lambs hit the ground. So we're taking 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, 180 day weights. So we're, we got a lot of hands on the animals, uh, keeping a close eye. And every time we do that, we, we take FAMACHA and we're looking for, um, parasites and we deworm when it's indicated, which hopefully isn't too often. 
All right, so that's sort of the background on our, our personal flock. And now I'm going to get a little bit more into the, the larger Katahdin community, so to speak. Before I dive into this, I just want to make a disclaimer that I am a member of all these organizations, but I, I'm not serving on any boards. I, this is just my honest opinion about how I've experienced these organizations and what I think they have to offer uh, anyone interested in Katahdins. So uh, starting at the top, Katahdin Hair Sheep International, KHSI. Uh, then there's the Eastern Alliance for Production Katahdins, or EAPK. And then at the bottom there, I've got the National Sheep Improvement Program, or NSIP. And uh, your involvement in these is going to depend on sort of your goals and uh, what you're hoping and what you're looking for. So uh, KHSI is definitely, that's open to anyone interested in Katahdins. You don't even have to own Katahdins. Um, actually, I don't think you have to own Katahdins to be uh, associate members of the other groups, but to be uh, active participants, you do. Um, and then those other two, the EAPK and NSIP, those are geared a little more towards, um, uh, you know, producers for income, genetic improvement, and um, more serious farming folks, maybe. Uh, so here's a, a little bit more information. There, there are fees associated with these organizations. So uh, in my opinion, I feel like the fees are, are uh, worth, worth the expenditure for the value I get out of them. Um, I guess, what should I focus on here? I guess I would say that, um, yeah, the KHSI is definitely sort of the, the most um, far reaching. It's the largest umbrella, you know, everyone from hobbyists to show folks to backyard producers to serious folks. Uh, our KHSI sort of has a place for everyone. Uh, EAPK is, uh, like I said, geared more towards the, the production folks. They've done a lot of great work uh, with hosting an annual symposium that's very informative. They also have a sale associated with that. Um, I've, I purchased a ram there um, and that was great. That was in Abingdon, Virginia a couple of years back. And then the National Sheep Improvement Program uh, gets a little more into the, the statistics and the quantitative assessment of the animals. So there, there's a lot more benefits, but then also a, a higher cost. I will mention that they do cap the enrollment fee for NSIP on um, if you have a larger flock. So uh, don't don't be deterred if if you uh, are running a lot of animals. So just sort of overall considerations if you're thinking about uh, joining any of these org organizations. Um, like I mentioned, KH KHSI is sort of the largest Katahdin community, so to speak. Um, I just want to highlight that the EAPK is not limited to the Eastern US. You can join from anywhere. Um, and if you're looking for mentorship and support, both EAPK and NSIP are, are great places to, to plug in, in my opinion. Um, NSIP is geared towards purebred producers. Um, so just something to, to keep in mind there. If you are crossing, um, it, it might not be for you. But that said, um, you don't have to be enrolled. You, your flock doesn't have to be enrolled in NSIP to benefit from it. Because if, if you're a commercial producer, you can purchase uh, sheep from NSIP producers. They're doing all the, the hard work of recording data and uh, doing this gen genetic improvement, submitting the data, all that. But you can still benefit um, from those improved genetics in your system if, if you're sourcing animals from them. So. So yeah, I just want to get a little bit more in in to this topic, and uh, I got a quote here from Lynn Farmeyer of, on the Sheep Things podcast: um, "The genetic potential of an animal, the genes that will be passed on to the next generation, are determined at inception. It is not determined at the feed trough." And that might sound obvious on the face of it, but I've been pretty surprised by how many people talk and operate under the uh, a reality as if that's not the case. Um, so. What's important to remember is that for a lot of traits, uh, there's this thing 80-20 rule or maybe the 70-30 rule, depending on, on specifically what trait we're looking at. But about 80% of what you see when you're looking at an animal is coming from its environment and it's uh, essentially how it was managed. And about 20% of what you're seeing is due to genetics. Um, and that has huge implications because you'll hear a lot of times um, People will, I see it all the time on, on the uh, listserv I'm on, where people will make claims about, I, we never deworm our animal, or 
no de no deworming what, name your trait but then they don't really provide any any data to back it up and, and the truth is they might just have a really long uh rotation on their pastures maybe they're dry lotting um who knows there could be a genetic component but you don't really know if you're not recording and you're not tracking progress and one of the really real strengths of NSIP is that it allows you to compare flocks across different management systems. The, the calculations and the statistical models that are going into to the data uh, are able to get through a lot of that environmental noise and just get down to the genetics of, of the animal. So I know this isn't, um, this isn't a, a presentation on NSIP. There's, uh, there are a lot of great presentations out there, but I just want to introduce a few core concepts in case anyone's thinking of learning more. So an EBV, that's really sort of the foundation of NSIP, and that stands for estimated breeding values. Uh, you can see EAPK's definition up here. It's the numeric representation of an animal's genetic potential for a given economically important production trait. Um, I think NSIP has a slightly different definition, but it's definitely the same idea. And what's important to realize is that uh, these estimated breeding values, they're based on phenotypic production data. So uh, you're only getting EBVs back for uh, things that you can measure and submit. Um, so there's EBVs available for uh, growth related traits, parasite resistance in the form of fecal egg counts, uh, carcass quality, and uh, of course fertility. Um, if you decide to get wool sheep or or you maybe already have wool sheep. I know there are uh, some, some breeds also eligible for NSIP and then uh, you could record some, some fleece traits, um, but obviously that's not relevant uh, for Katahdins. And uh, something I'm really excited about getting involved with is the geno genomically enhanced EBVs, which are uh, being rolled out this year, or sorry, rolled out in 2021. I, I'm finally taking advantage of them this year. Um, the Katahdins are the first sheep breed in the U.S. to have this technology available. It essentially involves taking a tissue sample and sending it in for analysis. There is a fee associated with it. Um, and what, what it's doing is, is it's really uh, amplifying the accuracy of, of the EBV. So uh, the EBV is obviously an estimate, so there's some error associated with that. And uh, being able to add ge genomics into that genetic analysis is really given a huge boost. And one way to think about it is that um, when you introduce genomics, you're able to get the equivalent of about 10 progeny, uh, the data from 10 progeny before that individual animal is sexually mature. And that has huge implications for uh, selection interval, generation interval, and all that. But I also wanna stress that while I'm a huge fan of GEBVs or EBVs, they don't address everything. Um, there aren't EBVs for confirmation. Uh, right now, there aren't any for longevity, feed efficiency, other things we might care about. So I just wanna stress that while I think this is a super valuable program and you get a lot of useful information out of it, there's still, it's not a replacement for uh, your eyes as a shepherd, uh, your preferences, things like confirmation and paying attention to those traits as well. Um, lastly, with NSIP, I just want to mention that um, you don't have to be enrolled or a member to start collecting the relevant data um, that you can then submit. So when you uh, enroll in NSIP, you sort of do an initial data dump or you submit your initial data and, it, and you can include as much historical data as you want in that initial submission. And you're only charged, uh, I think, for the first one or two years, um, sorry, the most recent one or two years. And the minimum data required to take advantage of NSIP are having a siren dam for each lamb, a birth date, litter size, rear type, you know, so if uh, there's born a, a twin, but then one died, it'd been, uh, litter size would be two, but a rear type would be one, and then a 60 day wait. You'll notice you don't need birth weight to, to enroll. Uh, I find birth weight really valuable uh, for adjust or for uh, calculating my own adjusted weights and calculating U efficiency percentage, um, but it is not required if, if that's uh, something you're not able to, to record in your system. So and if you're shopping for sheep or thinking about getting uh, Katahdins, I guess this would apply really to any breed. Um, I really recommend that you try to source your sheep 
from a producer with similar management system and uh, production goals. You might not be able to match exactly uh, either by geography or, you know, everyone has, there's so many um, iterations or options for, for raising sheep that you, you're unlikely to get an exact match, but the closer you can start out to where you want to get to, you know, the, the less work you're going to have to do. I also think it's important that you identify uh, your, your customer base uh, before you get sheep. Um, if you're going to be selling light lambs, uh, that grass-fed light lambs at 60 pounds, you're going to want really different genetics than if you're supplementing and trying to sell a 115, 120-pound lamb. Um, I, I'm a, a little hypocritical because I say here to take your time and visit farms and ask questions. When I wanted to get sheep, I didn't really want to wait too long, so I kind of just bought what was around. Um, it's worked out okay, but I probably could have save myself some hassle if I would have taken a, a, a deep breath and given myself a little more time to, to find a good fit. Um, if you do find a breeder that's reputable and out there, it's not uncommon to be uh, put on a waiting list. So just keep that in mind when you're inquiring. And um, there's also a lot of reputable auctions out there. I mentioned NSIP uh, hosting one, EAPK hosts one. Um, I'm not talking about your local sale barn. Obviously, you can get sheep wherever you want to get sheep, but uh, I strongly discourage anyone from, from purchasing animals at, at a sale barn where uh, most animals are going for meat. You're most likely just buying a lot of other people's problems. And lastly, I know I, like ewes are in pretty high demand, especially good ewe lambs. So you might have trouble finding high quality lambs. Um, or, or registered NSIP enrolled lambs use. So um, this is to an extent kind of what we did, but, but if you can purchase something that's, that's at least decent within reason, you know, and then really invest in a, in a high quality ram, um, that can be a, a, a nice sort of frugal way to, to get some really nice stock going. So you don't, I know there's a lot of graphs here and you don't need to look at the details, but you'll just notice this huge uptick. Sorry, this is our, this is from our first round of data submission um, to the National Sheep Improvement Program. And we'll see in every category from 2021 to 2022, we had a pretty significant increase in our uh, performance statistics. And we, that's largely due to the fact that we, you know, we spent some good money and we bought a RAM for $950 and another RAM for 700 bucks. And, um, you know, I think that was good value in the long run because you can see here we we made some immediate large improvements. So it's just sort of my closing thoughts. Um, I really recommend if you're getting into sheep uh, and you're not familiar with livestock already to to think about a biosecurity plan, have a plan for new arrivals, and have a quarantine area ready. And you know, again, I'm being a little hypocritical because I didn't really have all that set up and I I have paid for it so. Um, it's, these aren't fun things to think about, in my opinion. They're, it's hard to spend money investing in sort of emergency response stuff, but um, I really recommend it. Uh, when you need that stuff, you're going to be glad you, you've already put some thought into it. Um, something that I've ch found challenging as a, a new and beginning farmer and shepherd is that I've seen a lot of enterprise budgets and been in a lot of conversations with more experienced and seasoned shepherds who uh, essentially say they don't spend any money on vets because they can do all of this stuff themselves. Um, I think that's awesome. I'm very envious of those folks and I hope to get there someday. But if you're just starting out, um, developing a good relationship with your vet is invaluable. And, you know, unfortunately we have to pay our vet a lot of money for health related things when they come up, but I always try to learn from her. Uh, we're really lucky in that our, Martha here, our vet is also a good friend. So that certainly helps. But um, when I call her out to take care of something like a vaginal prolapse, I make sure I, I'm standing there right by her. I'm learning how to do it. And then hopefully then the, the next time that comes along, I'm not calling her and I'm, I'm able to do it myself. So uh, just a plug there for, for working on a good vet relationship. And then definitely keep good records. And might sound obvious, but it's really hard to, to improve your flock without good records. And you'll think you'll remember stuff and you won't. Um, lastly here, 
I think it's important if you are trying to breed uh, and improve your, your genetic merit to, to remember that genetic improvement is a marathon and not a sprint. There's another good quote from Lynn. Um, you know, this is a, a bit of a, a slow burn and, and as the process goes. You got to um, make incremental steps in the right direction. Maybe you'll make some backwards, but as long as you keep going uh, where you want to get to. And I also think it, when it comes to selection, it's Im important to realize the reality of where you and your flock are at. Um, when I was first starting out, I'd hear about people who had, you know, bad hooves and that sheep was done, bad whatever, and that they were colon. And I was like, if I did that, I wouldn't have any sheep. So um, I had to be a little more lax early on. And uh, if they were, you know, if they were raising lambs, they weren't, they were doing it on their own and they weren't uh, causing me huge problems from a management perspective, that was good enough. Now, as I get my numbers up and I have more animals to select from, I can sort of uh, turn up the volume or crank the knob a bit on that selection pressure, but uh, it's okay if you're not, you're not going to start out right where you want to be, I guess. And then just to, to close things here, if you're thinking about Katahdins, I just want to mention that it, it, there's a, a rich breed history that's full of nonconformists all the way back to Mr. Peel himself. Um, I saw some other names on, on this participant list. I think uh, Robert Walker's on here with the Sheep Things podcast. I saw Laura Fortmeyer. If you don't know those names, um, you'll, you'll know them soon if you get into Katahdins, but uh, you're joining a, a great community of people that you know are looking to, to push things. Uh, I've found other breeders and the organizations I've participated, participated in to be very supportive uh, very willing to share uh, and get offer guidance. And, you know, I think it's exciting to be involved with a, a breed that's really transforming the sheep industry um, and being a leader in that regard as evidenced by uh, uh, genomically enhanced EBVs being available. And uh, the breed slogan for Katahdins is a, a breed whose time has come. And I think that that's a, a very relevant and great um, way to be uh, to think about Katahdins because uh, they've got a lot to offer the sheep industry at large. So uh, I think with that, I'm gonna sign off and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions here. If you wanna reach out to me at my email, I'm always happy to talk more or chat on the phone. I love talking about sheep and trees and dogs and all that. So, all right, I'll turn it back over. All right, thank you guys. That was really fantastic. Um, I have uh, some Katahdins um, and St. Croix. I prefer my St. Croix, but I'm, I guess I probably shouldn't say that, but um, <laughs> I do like I do like the Katahdins and I can see um, a lot of value in them. And Alex, I think uh, you, were, you made a really good point uh, with the rams. We've done that with pretty much all the species on our farm. It's like we find the best um females um, we're, no matter what species it is and then we always choose spectacular males and that's what we breed to so we're always improving our breeding stock so it makes a big difference all right so um that really was really informative um so much great information you guys are amazing um but so we're gonna uh take some time take a little bit of time here and go through the questions steve has actually gone through and answered a lot of them so you can actually just go to the q a and go to the answered tab and then that will actually um uh you can see how he has answered those questions um, so that's, uh, it's the second one over. And then there's another one that says dismissed, but there aren't any that have been dismissed. Um, but we'll just go through the ones that have not, that are still open that have not been answered. So you can feel free to go ahead and, uh, look at those on your own. Um, while, if you, uh, Alex and Steve, if you want to just read through those and formulate some of your thoughts. And for those of you in the audience, if you want to actually type in some questions, that's great too. I am actually going to go ahead and, um, launch our, our poll that we like to do at the end of each webinar. This is really helpful for us. It, um, helps us get funding for the webinars because we do, um, you know, it takes staff time and then we also do pay our presenters. So it's important for us to be able to get more, um, more money and all these, the answers to all these questions help us do that, get more funding. It's all about money. Um, all right. I'm going to let that run for just a few more seconds. 
Um, I'm going to start with a question from Dante. Um, he asks, and I think this goes back to one of Steve's slides um, um, about, I think you were feeding a lamb, um, and he was asking, do you milk by hand or do you use something else? And can you further explain your culling practices? I feel like um, Alex, you both, um, I, I think, answered that as time went on. So you probably don't need to answer that part. Um, but uh, do you, when you're, do you use a formula or are you milking your katahdins to feed the baby, feed uh, the bottle fed lambs? Um, we will, <clears throat> we'll milk out mom if it's possible. Most of our <clears throat> bottle lambs have been because of an issue with, with milking udders. So we've often had to resort to, to a formula. Um, and the, you know, Catan milk output is not tremendous, um, compared to, you know, a milk breed. So, um, it's not good for that purpose if that was the intent of the question, but I think it, yeah, if it was related to the bottle lambs when we can definitely, and ideally, especially the colostrum when, when, you know, we're in the first 24 hours or so, um, after birth. Yeah. yeah actually, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Alex. I was just gonna say there's some, there's some. Uh, talk in the chat about um, breeding katahdins for milking. So, but go ahead, Alex. Yeah, no, I would say, I mean, I, if the issues, oftentimes we're also bottle lambing because of an issue with the udder. Um, I've, I'll try to strip some out, but at least none of my use like their udder being milked. <laughs> they, uh, they'll they kick the bucket right over. Uh, they're definitely not used to that. And then yeah, in terms of just quantity, they're they're not producing a lot. Um, if if I were wanting sheep for dairy, I would definitely get different breeds personally. All right, Gavin would like to know um, a little bit more about your deworming. So when you do deworm, do you you do you use ivermectin or what do you use? There's a couple of questions about that. Yeah, we um, so I definitely recommend talking to your vet or local um, extension, whatever, because I know there's a lot of issues with resistance and that can vary regionally. Uh, we've been advised to use a combination of uh, fenben, not fenben, yeah, fenbendazole and cydectin, and that's all weight-based. So you would look at the label and estimate the, the weight of the animal and sort of administer accordingly. Uh, Steve, did you want to answer that? When you worm, what do you use? Yeah, we, we don't do any routine deworming and haven't really needed to other than for the meningeal worm. Um, and our vet, uh, ivermectin is one of three um, elements to subscribe that I'm not going to remember off the top of my head because I follow my vet's instructions as one should. <laughs> <laughs> so we just, yeah, we just did one that recovered very nicely. That's one that is really scary if you actually lose a sheep to it, but if you get ahead of it, it can be pretty treatable. So we've had some pretty good success with that. And I guess there's a webinar you all are doing on that. Yeah, we're doing a webinar tomorrow. Rachel White is doing, um, she's a PhD candidate for the University of Maine. And uh, that's what her whole project has been about, has been about the meningeal worms. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm sure there's gonna be tons to learn. Um, so it, to keep in mind that ivermectin kills roundworms and fembenzidol kills like tapeworms and other kinds of worms. So you can't, you wouldn't wanna stick with, it depends on what you've got. So you're not gonna, you're not gonna treat with ivermectin and you've got tapeworms, your problem in your animals, so. Okay. And a new, a new recommendation just, from our last nice gap meeting was to for us was to do two at the same time to try to cut down on that resistance emerging so trying to ratchet up the pressure i guess on them but yeah ivermectin essentially doesn't work here is what i've been told so we don't really use it um so gavin would like to know and i'm assuming this is for you alex what kind of hay are you growing oh yeah i saw that and then I got sweaty because I'm not a hay guy. Um, <laughs> basically, I basically plant what I would want for my pastures, which is a lot of orchard grass and clovers, um, um, some bird's foot trefoil and stuff. And then I'm mostly interested in pasture production. So for me, haying is more taking what's there and making use of it. Um, I'm not trying to seed specifically for hay. I think I did start using a little more... Um, Ladino 
clover just because I wanted white clover and I figured if I was planting it, I might as well plant something that made better hay than Dutch white. And then I wanted to use more red clover, but there was a big shortage last year. So I haven't been seeding that because I couldn't get it. Um, yeah. We have a lot of brome and Timothy, just sort of legacy grasses that are already there out there. So that's definitely in the mix as well. All right, Alex, somebody, and I think Steve, you've got guardian dogs as well. If you could just talk a little bit about what breeds you have and why you selected those breeds. Yeah, we have Pyrenees, um, great Pyrenees. I'm, we're pretty sure that our uh, older guy, Burke, is probably a mix. We think maybe some Anatolian Shepherd. Um, he's a little bigger than a Pyrenees would probably be, and his hair coat quality isn't great. And I know that can happen sometimes with crossbreeding. Um, for us, we're, we're new to, not new to dogs, but new to livestock guardian dogs. And, um, there's a great fact presentation on, uh, <laughs> on LGDs. Yeah. And, you know, they sort of mentioned that Pyrenees are sort of the, probably the best entry level dog. If you're new to LGDs, it is a skill set um, managing the LGD breeds. And so we felt like Pyrenees were pretty, uh, pretty approachable. Uh, we also have a lot of farm visitors and we have a, a house dog and all that. So uh, Pyrenees, I, I think, can do a decent job at sort of learning, doing some discernment over what's a threat and who's a friend and who's a foe. Maybe better than some of the more high octane LGD breeds. Steve, do you, you have LGDs, right? No, I actually don't. Uh, I mean, we have a we have a pet Pyrenees, but he he's not he was not raised. We got him as a rescue. He was not raised in that culture. So um, no, we don't and haven't needed them. We we maintain hot fences and um, and our predator pressure is relatively low, and we haven't had an issue. So yeah. Okay, thank you. So Sarah would like to know what are your annual cost averages per animal? If you're comfortable answering that. <laughs> Yeah, I'll probably have to cop out a bit because, frankly, we're just we're expanding and um, I don't have great production data yet. Um, I mean, I could, I could look into my feed costs. I know we're at about a round bale per head per winter, um, maybe a bale and a half. So at $55, $65 a bale, we're up to about, you know, $70 to $100 a year uh, winter feeding. But yeah, in terms of mineral and vet bills and infrastructure um, be up more than that for sure. Yeah, I don't, I guess I don't have a cost per animal. I think um, our, we, we do annual budgeting for the, for the flock and the management and the, the real, um, and that a version early version of that's actually in the silver pasture book as an example and the trick with budgeting is that there's no uniform budget it's it's a tool that you make and then reflect on and learn from and i think the thing we've learned most is that it's it all comes down to the labor that's the cost and i think to alex's point earlier we we also breed so that we're not feeding any winter feed to anyone who's not bred so um, that I think reduces costs. And then, and then the factors you're, you're buying a certain amount of, of hay. That's, that's the biggest feed costs. We don't really pay for any other feed costs because we're amplifying grazing. What we pay for is the, the labor to move. So, so then it's always a question of how do we improve the efficiency of that labor? So for instance, early on, we only had enough fence to like make a paddock or maybe two paddocks. Now we have enough to make five or six paddocks. And we found that, and then now we do a lot of Perimeter fence with the net. We're also limited in our um, any sort of permanent fencing, like like Alex. But we'll do a perimeter fence with um, with the net, and then we'll run just single or double strands uh, strand fencing as subdivision in between. So we can fence out a really big field, subdivide it if they happen to get through. It's really not a big deal. It's saved a lot of time for us. So we're just constantly figuring out like how do we do this rotational grazing thing more efficiently. Um, so I'll say that. Yeah, that's definitely for us with our sheep, the biggest expense is, is moving them because they just, you know, they they mostly eat grass. And so it's just the hay and it's they really don't eat that much. It doesn't seem like. 
Um, uh, Meet Suite, with, which is out of Cornell University, actually, they have a way for you to, um, they prompt you with different questions on, and so you can put in all of your costs and then um, they can give, they'll give you how much you should be charging for your meat. Um, it's geared a little bit more towards the beef guys, but I'm pretty sure they have a lamb section to it as well. I haven't looked at it in a while, but um, that would be a good place to start. And I, I've already I've already got somebody lined up for the fall for one of our webinars to talk about pricing. So pretty excited about that because it's one of the biggest questions we always come up with. Um, Devana would like to know, how do you control ticks on sheep? Yeah, we we don't. I don't. I don't know. I'd be curious what other people do. I see a lot of ticks on them. Um, some of them react, you know, to the bite spot for the most part. I don't know. I assume they can handle it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we don't do anything particular. If anybody does do something, um, please feel free to put that in the chat to help Devana with that. Um, they answer to that question. Um, Elaine would like to know, uh, could you mix two breed types if the goal is not to raise lambs, but to manage landscapes? So for example, um, Katahdin and Dorper. Yeah, I don't see why not. I mean, I have a friend who she raises sheep for their wool qualities, but her she, she'll admit it. She just likes trying out different breeds. So I think She's got a pretty mixed flock now, three, four different types. And at one point she had a Shetland in there. So, you know, it's <laughs> mixing it up. Um, Those Shetlands are cute. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'd ever do a wool breed though. Cause I don't know that whole shearing thing. I'm not going down that road. That just sounds like a nightmare, but they're super cute. I like them a lot. Um, Steve, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I think there's no right way to, to do breeding, crossbreeding, not anything like that. I think it depends on your goals, what what sort of, you know, advancement you want to be a part of. I think Alex's point to the sort of larger community and, and that effort is is really valid and important. Um, I think the the thing I've seen from a lot of folks I've consulted with is like the, the opposite tact of just like kind of the hodgepodge effect is, is a lot of unhealthy animals. So I still think the protocols for monitoring record keeping and selection and calling are really important and and when you're again uh, our experience when you're treating them as a, a pet it can be really there's a different attachment and that can lead to decisions which then are amplified as you continue to breed them if you're not going to breed them maybe it's not as big of an issue but if you're going to breed don't pass those traits on it's going to just hurt you in the long run so my philosophy with pet animals, because we have to have a pet with everything because I can't help myself, is that I just don't breed them. They're just pets. Yeah. <laughs> and you just yeah. have to admit that they're pets. But just yep. don't don't bring the genetics, unless they're good genetics. But if they're not good genetics, just don't bring them into your flock or any any animal. It doesn't matter what your species is. Yeah. Okay. Cindy would like to know, how many lambing years can you expect from a you? Curious to see what you guys have to say about that. We had a 15-year-old um Leia, uh, you who Leia, Katahdin who lambed and she had triplets but she did not produce any milk so that was the last year I bred her and then I think she died like a year later but um they stay fertile for a while in my experience yeah yeah I guess oh go ahead Alex no you start <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think our oldest was nine years, who was was definitely showing some her, the the year last year she lambed she had a, a real hard time and it was it was clear that it was it was a push for her so and then she literally like collapsed and it was really kind of sad because she kind of we, we were like great we'll give you one more grazing year we'll bought to feed your babies and she kind of like collapsed mid season like she just wasn't up for grazing anymore so I feel like after the sixth year is sort of like. Uh, an unknown. I think it's good to uh, push the healthy ones and not over push the ones that aren't aren't your rock stars. So our neighbor has one that's yeah, I think twelve or thirteen years and still still throwing lambs just fine. I think those are anomalies. I think probably like eight to ten years is 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 a reasonable you know ceiling. Um, but I know folks that are producing more at larger scales and they'll cycle their lambs out a lot a lot younger. So you know. 
That's interesting that you say that, Steve, because I've got a whole group of youths that I got at the same time, and they all were still lambing 13, 12, 13, 14. Shamu was a little unusual because right. she was 15. But yeah. um yeah, and keeping weight on, I mean, because that's sort of my my criteria as well. If they mm -hmm. if they're not going to keep weight on while they're uh, nursing, then I I I sort of cool them out of the cycle. Yeah. Alex, great. thoughts on that? I don't have a lot of personal experience to go on. I think our oldest girl right now is two and a half. Um, but that's because <laughs> well, we got it's not all not all by choice, but um. Yeah, I mean, I think I know with uh, NSIP and there's this awesome project right now, they're doing the Sheep Gems project, G-E-M-S. And I'm pretty sure longevity is one of the things they're trying to start exploring more from a genetic component. Um, as you can imagine, I think it's a really hard thing to measure um, and sort of tease yeah. out those genetic uh, influences. But I think genotyping has some potential there. Um, I guess maybe, I don't know if this is totally relevant, but just something to consider is that the shorter your generation interval, the faster your rate of genetic improvement from a breeding perspective, but there's still value in having, keeping older productive animals. Because if you're a, if you're a seed stock producer, you want to improve, but if you're a commercial producer, you want animals that are producing lambs for 10 years. So um, if you can keep those, high performing longevity use in your flock it it sort of shows that your animals are at least capable of that um or at least some of them are in the right setting all right so we are at 4 30 i'm just gonna take maybe two more questions and then i'm really afraid guys we're gonna have to be done i do see there are some questions about the guardian animals I would um refer you to facts webinars we did a series with jan donner I think, yeah, it was Jane Donner and um, she's amazing and she's written books and all this other kind of stuff. And she's, um, so if you just put her name in the search in our, in our, on our webinar on the website, um, you can um, just watch those because she knows a lot. Um, and then there's also um, a fair amount of questions about, oh, scabies. Huh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> and um so I'm going to ask two more questions and I'm just going to go in order because these are all such great questions. Um, so Joel wants to know, he's in the Piney Woods area of Northeast Texas with 48 inches of rain. Are Katahdin a good choice uh, per year, I'm assuming? Um, are Katahdin a good choice for that environment? So I guess hot and wet. Um, I would... I guess my non-expert opinion would be, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think as long as I, I can't imagine many breeds that are more adaptable than Katahdin, um, as long as they, you know, all their requirements to thrive were being met, um, I imagine they'd be pretty adaptable. I know hair, there's a lot of hair sheep in Texas, uh, my understanding. Yeah, I think my sense is the the cross of the sort of Caribbean influence and the the northern influence they seem remarkably cold and hot tolerant and you know enjoy and enjoy it too <laughs> so <clears throat> I, I would i would definitely yeah consider them for that well we're in north carolina the piedmont north carolina and they do fine here and we're we've got maybe 35 inches a year to 40 somewhere in there so mm -hmm. All right, we're going to do one last question, and this is specifically for Steve from Jamie. Um, can you elaborate on NRCS practices and what you uh, and what uh, bleh, that you were successful with, and which you would recommend other farmers inquire about? I think that's a good one. So yeah, I think NRCS program cost share funding project funding is is a bit of a rabbit hole, and I'll say from the outset that your local agent is like the the keeper of that rabbit hole, whether you want to go down it or not. So if someone is like a good uh, communicator and is transparent and clearly wants to um, uh, go to bat to amplify your payments to the highest degree, which is really important because you can you can get almost nothing for some programs and you can get paid well for some programs. And, and it's important to navigate that or it's not worth your time. So you really have to have the right person. Um, and, and and build a relationship with that person is what I'd say. And then what we've done, we, we've enrolled our pasture in conservation stewardship program, which is nice because 
if well done, you can get an annual payment uh, for conservation practices you're already doing. And then you just have to do a few what they call enhancements, which are um, you know, changes to different uh, land uses or, or different parts of your land use. You can do things as simple as mulching. You can do things as complicated as removing vegetation or planting trees or things like that. You can kind of choose. Um, and that's worked well. And then with EQIP, we're currently doing a forest management plan that will help with our civil pasture planning, which we've already been doing, but we're getting it sort of formalized. And then that equal funding will open up opportunity that, that management plan will open up opportunities for funding projects. And then also eventually the goal of equip projects are that they set you up to enroll your land in a conservation program. So basically if, if your agent is helpful, they will help you build a plan long-term so that you're adding, adding programs up <clears throat> and then getting the maximum um, benefit from those programs. And there's plenty of funding out there. There's no limit of funding. It's really that question of, um, local representatives and and how well you can work with them. So um, hopefully you have a good one. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Steve. So I have a few housekeeping items to share before we sign off today. A recording of this webinars and the slides will be available soon. Those documents will be archived on our website and Larissa will also email them to you not till next week when she returns from her much deserved week off. She's We had the most uh, grants we've ever done before and uh, handed out the most money and Larissa does all of it. So she's a little, she needs a break. Uh, we also have one more webinar in our spring webinar lineup and have already started planning for the fall. I'm so excited, I can hardly stand it. Um, a sincere thank you to you, Steve and Alex. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you with us. And I look forward to having you back, back again soon. I really hope so. Um, I also like, I'd also like to give a special shout out to my colleague Larissa for everything she does to prepare for our webinars. And finally, I would like to thank everyone out there in the audience for their interest and attention. I hope you had a good experience today and we'll stay in touch and reconnect soon. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye for now. <laughs>